So it was about three and a half years ago, I got one of those phone calls, phone call of desperation. Things were at stake. Things had been exposed and there was a crossroad. It's gonna be one way or the other. Marriage was at stake, family was at stake, Christianity was at stake. And this message today is a result of what happened after that phone call. So I'm going to invite Michael Gossam to come up today and he's going to be sharing the word of God. Let's give him a clap as he comes up today. And so today we are talking about freedom from addictions. So get ready, open your heart up, open up your minds. This is not a subject that we talk a lot about in church. So today we're going to hit it full on and we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do in people's lives today. Thank you, Michael. Uh, good morning, church. Good morning. morning. Is everyone happy to be in the house of God? Yes. Amen. Amen. So it's always a privilege to speak especially for delivering the message of God. And together with this message, I will be testifying as well my personal experience on how God delivered me from addiction. Specifically here with my testimony, it is something that is not exactly ignored, but it's not confronted by most churches. And that is, the addiction of pornography. So we've just finished uh, this term about First Peter chapter 2, which is about Christians experiencing their trials in their lives. Uh, it may be external, say for example, with your community, or internally, uh, when you're dealing uh, a war within yourself. So let me just read through the main verse. Oh, this one. Uh, oh, there. Okay. All right. Let me read. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. So before we start, I'm going to ask uh, a question, and it's not about, about like if you have any addiction. What I'm going to ask is, can you raise up your hand if you love God? Raise your hand with those who love God. Now, follow-up question is, as we love God, do we fear him as well? Do we genuinely fear him as well? So you might ask, what is the relation between having the fear of the Lord and being free from addiction? It is about gaining the knowledge, the wisdom that you need, the grace that we needed to fight against any form of addiction. King Solomon says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All right, let's go through. All right. The first part is the struggle is real. So we have to acknowledge that it is actually happening. It's not something that is just for those who haven't received Christ as of this world, but it is actually a thing that's happening within the church itself, the body of Christ. Let me give you some statistics uh, that was done in the United States uh, back in 2020. So 47% of families are having problems with pornography and 56% led to divorce. You would say that probably that's just for them. We are not affected by it, but let me add additional information. 
68% of Christian men do watch pornography. 33% are women. And shockingly, 50% are church leaders and pastors. So we have to acknowledge that we have to expose this. It is not something that we should be hiding. It is time that we have to confront it as a body of Christ. Because this will destroy you not just individually, your families, your communities, but especially it affects everyone who we are trying to reach out. Remember, the thing that you are trying to preach is something that must reflect into your own lives as well. You cannot preach something that you do not apply unto yourselves. So I was first exposed to pornography when I was like 13 years old. And usual with men, it's with your classmates back in school. So as parents, parents I have to like make sure that all of us here are um, making sure that the environment that your children are is in a setting wherein they are not exactly introduced to these kinds of things. And the good thing is we have the uh, Lighthouse Church, uh, I mean the school, so we're definitely safe with that. But still, we need to be vigilant in terms of looking or looking after our children. So I was exposed to it when I was 13, but do you know that the average age of kids who get exposed to it is 11 years old. And by the time they reach 14 years old, majority of them have already seen at least one material. It is not a problem if you haven't believed yet, you haven't received Christ yet, because it says in the, in the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 13, there was, there's a wide gate and a narrow gate. We used to walk in the wider gate wherein it is very smooth. There's no difficulty. There's no terrain. There's no blocks. And everyone goes to it because it is what they seem to be normal. But when you believe in Christ, when you accept him already, you have to enter the narrow gate. And that's where things uh, become difficult. Because we are then exposed to the fact that what we do normally is actually sin. It says in the book of Romans, chapter 6, 16, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience or leading to righteousness. It doesn't matter if you're single or married. The thing is, the intimacy that you're supposed to be sharing with God if you're single, or the intimacy that you're sharing with your spouse if you're married, the enemy is stealing that from you. The intimacy that you're supposed to share to one another, the, the devil is getting all of that. He's hugging all of that instead of you sharing it to God or to your spouse. So how do we react when our sin is exposed? Do we like, like feel shame? Are we afraid? Do we feel remorse? The normal reaction be like to be fearful, like to be sorrowful. These two emotions are correlated. Sorrow is def uh, defined as deep sadness, regret, especially for the loss of someone or something. So there are two kinds of um, Fear and two kinds of sorrow. The worldly um, fear, which leads to worldly sorrow. The other one is godly fear, which leads to godly sorrow. A good example of these are two kings in the Old Testament, King Saul and King David. When King Saul was confronted by the prophet um, Samuel about his sin, Saul knew he had sinned against God, but what did he do first? What was he fearful of? What was he remorseful of? He told um, Samuel, says, I sinned against the Lord, but now bless me in front of the, of the elders. Bless me in front of my kingdom. 
he was afraid of losing his position, losing his power, losing his kingdom itself. And that, the fact, is recognized as something carnal. On the other hand, when King David uh, committed a sin of murder and adultery, he was confronted by Prophet Nathan. And when he knew that he had committed a sin, he said, I have offended, I have grieved the one that I love. He was afraid not of the things that he will lose here on earth, but he was afraid of losing the presence of God. He was afraid that as he walked in this life, regardless if he had everything, power, money, but he, he knew that if God wasn't with him, all of these are worthless. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. When I was confronted with my sin, my initial reaction was, am I going to lose my family? Am I going to lose my wife? It seems like it's okay, but it's not. You're still putting God as your second option. Our first thing that you should be fearful is, God, are you leaving me? Are you walking away from my presence, Lord God? See, there's nothing wrong with like regretting, like losing your family or the things that you have. But if you put them first, then these are considered as worldly fear and worldly sorrow. So what do we need to do? You have to make a decision. We have to make a decision. We have to make a decision that we have to repent. Repentance is not just a single act. Repentance is a lifetime decision of hating sin. You have to hate sin because God cannot deliver you with something that you do not hate. If you still plan to cling on it, God will never deliver you from it. You have to actually hate it. You have to actually love God and hate sin. You see, the enemy can only entice you. He cannot make you do things. At the end of the day, it is your choice if you do commit the sin or not. So we cannot blame the devil. The devil made me do it. No, that was your decision. It was difficult for me probably when after I received Christ because I knew already sin, but still I kept on sinning. So I was in a cycle of sin, feeling guilt, and asking for forgiveness for 10 years. And this took place even after receiving God. The problem was when I received Christ, Remember, when you get baptized, you should receive Christ as your Lord and your Savior. I was happy that He was my Savior because He saved me from my sins. But the fact that Him being my Lord means I have to give up everything. And that's the part wherein I failed. I mean, I did not surrender my entirety to Him. I knew I loved God, but I did not fear Him. I took him for granted, knowing that whatever I do, he will not leave my presence. As we make decision, it says on Deuteronomy 30, 15, See, I have said before you today, life and good, death and evil. We should make this choice for ourselves. Also, on 2 Chronicles 7:14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Have you had like a form of sickness? Have you had like any form of trial that's not resolving? A lot of times... This is the result of not fully repenting. 
Next, how do we fight it? We fight it with God. It says on Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Additionally, on 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, it says, Flee sexual immorality. Yes. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he will commit sexual immorality yes. sins against his own body. So when, when I was confronted with the act, I tried to, the reason probably, I mean, not probably, but definitely is, I was trying to fight sin, temptation on my own strength. I think the, the longest period was like eight months. Then after that, I gave in. You see, we are not fighting against flesh. We are fighting against the spiritual realm. You, we, you may not see it, but we are actually fighting the forces of the enemy, the devil himself. Yes. You cannot fight spiritual with something that is flesh. You will lose. You can never win. And as you fight with God, the only thing that you can rely on is God's grace. Yes. Ask for God's grace daily to empower you. Because that's the only thing that will sustain you. And like what I've said, when we repent, it is a lifetime choice. So be prepared. This is going to be a lifetime battle. As we flee from sexual immorality, it says from 1 Peter 5.8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So God wants us to be sober, free from intoxication, and be vigilant, meaning we have to be alert and watchful. It needs to be both because you might be sober, but if you're not vigilant, the enemy can always attack you and you can always give in. As you read that, uh, bottom part of First Peter 5, 8, it says the devil walks about like a roaring lion. He's not the lion. The lion of Judah is Christ. He can only imitate what Christ has done. He can only imitate the position of God, but he is not the lion. So as he's trying to compare himself to God, he actually twists as well the truth. So when the Holy Spirit convicts us of our mistakes, of our sins, what the devil will try to do is condemn you, put you to shame and guilt. And see, he wants you to be in that state so that you will not go to God and ask for forgiveness. He will put you in a cycle wherein you'll just do things according to your uh, own will and not ask for forgiveness and help from him. And with my final message, we have to break the power of shame and live for God's purpose. So when things went well with, with my wife and my family, because def definitely this sin actually almost destroyed me from within, almost destroyed my family, my marriage life, and more importantly, I almost destroyed my entire relationship with God. One way that we can break the power of shame is to actually testify. The devil doesn't want us testifying about the power of God. The devil doesn't want us proclaiming to everyone, especially to those who haven't received the power of his grace. Because every time we do it, he loses one soul to his kingdom and it all goes to God's kingdom. For us to know that we are not fully anymore under the power of shame, my wife actually told me, why not do a testimony? Why not actually tell everyone about it? It doesn't matter if you put yourself to the lowest position. It doesn't matter if people will talk about your mistakes. What matters is we glorify God's name. It says on Romans 
Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, brothers and sisters, God is merciful to forgive if we only humble ourselves, come to His presence. Love, I mean, God loves us like His children. Love in a way that love is rebuking us with truth. It is not affirmation with lies. We don't just tell people just for them to feel better, full of lies. But if we truly love one another, especially as God loves us, we have to rebuke everyone, especially if we know our fellow brothers and sisters are actually committing a sin. Rebuke them gently, approach them well, as God is merciful to us. But we have to actually acknowledge the fact that the act is a sin. God corrects whom he loves. Same with our children, we correct our children. We correct them regardless if they get angry with us, regardless if they fully understand why we are rebuking them. But we have to rebuke them because we love them, we know what's the best for them. And that's the same for God. God is rebuking us because He knows the best for us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Probably this is a message to, to my fellow brothers. It is always easy to commit a sin, especially if no one's watching. It is always easy to do something, especially if no one can judge you. But do we actually have the courage to do it? Especially knowing that only God can see you. We have to be aware that every time we do it, we just doesn't like offend other people or offend even offend uh, ourselves for doing it because it is, a, it is a shameful act but we have to know that we are offending god's heart we are actually putting him away from our presence and that it should be our main goal to be one with god Last verse, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for, uh, together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to, to His purpose. So even the fact that you actually have committed a sin and you have been delivered and you have testified, that is according to God's purpose. It is not an accident. He actually let it happen so that His name, like it says in the Second Corinthians, so that His name may be glorified. So, there are some of us here that might have probably not just a, a pornography in terms of addiction. It can be in different forms. It could be in a form of money, in a form of our job, anything that put God on second place whatever that first thing is that is your addiction and when we have resolved it always commit yourselves continue to walk with God when you have been delivered testify proclaim the Word of God reach out to those who haven't received yet we are not identified by our sins or mistakes we are identified by the one whom has saved us. Your value is not your, your um, self-identity. Your value is what God is willing to pay for. God was willing to pay for each and every one of our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. So that is our worth. Our worth is the blood of Christ. Our worth is not the amount of, of the things we have done, the good things that uh, we have performed, that's not our worth. Our worth is the blood of Christ which has redeemed us from our sins. So when we continue to walk with God, 
the things that we do for Him, always remember when we have been delivered, these things will never identify us individually. We are identified by the love of God that He has given and continually gives to us. So if anyone is here who is having a problem with any form of addiction, um, just close your eyes and I will lead you to a prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, I come before you. Lord, I'm weak. I'm sinful, O oh Lord God. I have nothing to boast on you, Lord God. Lord, I need your grace. Empower me, Lord God. I cannot fight this battle on my own, O oh Lord God. Lord, give me strength to overcome any form of temptations, O oh Lord God. Lord, for you alone, you are my strength. Lord, deliver me from the hands of the enemy, O oh Lord God. And as I reach out to you, Lord God, forgive me of my sins. Lord, I repent from any of it, O oh Lord God. And help me, Lord God, to continue this lifelong repentance as I pursue your heart. This I ask in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. If anyone needs any prayer, um, we have our elders and our pastor. Um, you can do it now or even after the service if you wanted to. So, God bless. How powerful was that from his own personal experience? And, you know, it is time for us to get serious with God and fear God. I know I had a cycle of addiction in my own life when I was first married it was bulimia and you know reading up on that it says it takes years of psychological help to get free from that it was a horrible thing it was deceptive it was separating me from intimacy with God and those that I loved around me and it was secretive it was dark it was shameful and it was a cycle that I tried to break so many times but it was only when I did what Michael said, and that is the fear of the Lord. Wow. Fearing the Lord. That every time I did it, I was bringing him into it, and I was, my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And it wasn't until the fear of the Lord, I really let that permeate every part of my life. It's, that is completely gone, just like that. So thank God. So there's many different addictions, that's right. It could be Netflix, it could be money, it could be food, whatever it is. You know, we could put them on a scale, but they're all sin because they're taking the place of God in our life. So as we stand up to sing this song, I want you to do business with God today. And if you need some prayer to break something or just prayer, you know, we have to humble ourselves. It's shameful. But God is a God of retribution. He's a God of, um, he's not a God of condemnation. He's a God of conviction. So we're going to stand up and sing this song. and Come forward for some prayer if you need it before I finish off the service. Mm -hmm. 